Uh, so I'm going to go ahead, first little logistics part there. Um, I apologize for the internet. Again, I, you know, um, so if you can't connect, you know, just try and get it. Eventually you will have to like get on Moodle uh, today for something uh, in our, our lecture. Um, Fingers crossed, you know, that works. Otherwise, we'll, we'll figure that out. Uh, I'm going to send the message to our IT department to kind of, hey, this classroom, no one can get on the Wi-Fi. Uh, so cool with that. Uh, as a reminder, you've got your lecture exercise due on Monday. Uh, so by all means, make sure to have it done if you have not. I've seen a lot of you already finished it. Some of you finished it literally in class Monday. Um, but, I mean, you know, again, it's not meant to be hard. It's meant to, get, you know, again, your vacation is over. We're back to work. So, hey, you know, get your brain turning again on that concept of, like, I got I to gotta think about an agent because, as you can clearly see, I'll just immediately start going into it. What we're getting into today is this idea that, hey, Okay, you know, we're going to be talking about artificial intelligence. And specifically, if we remember from Monday's class, I kind of said that what we're looking at when we talk about uh, artificial intelligence and trying to build programs or applications that can utilize artificial intelligence, what we actually mean is we can have something that we call an agent. And that agent can make a decision based on all its best possible outcomes. It's trying to pick the best decision uh, out of there. And so that's kind of where we get into uh, these things. So how we kind of start to look at this architecture is this idea that, again, we have the agent. If you want to think of it like a tiny little robot or a human or uh, a program, uh, you know, uh, what YouTube shows you when you go on YouTube or what TikTok decides, that's the agent, right? The thing that makes the decision. But, right, then we've got, I don't know why I went to both sides for this, but then we've got the idea of the environment. What does the agent see, or where does the agent, you know, air quotes here, exist, is what we're trying to kind of uh, think about when we look at this idea of the environment. Because, well, if we think about the agent, again, it's trying to make decisions based on its current state, based on its current kind of situation, and that decision may have some implications to the environment, right? Some of you are, who hears game development, right? I want to pick up, uh, um, it's Minecraft. You want to build a, an AI for Minecraft, right? There's a piece of wood. What happens when your agent picks up the piece of wood? So think about what happens to literally its code. It's not just you have wood and wood's not on ground. Like code also starts, to, you know, the entire uh, uh, ecosystem changes when you pick up wood or when your agent picks up wood. So again, this is that idea is that the environment is um, outputting this information. Just stop for a second. Look around you. Look around you. That's the environment. If you treat yourself like an agent for a second, what's happening? All this light is being bounced into your eyes. You have perceptors uh, that will, or you have sensors that are telling you, oh, hey, there's a desk right there. There's a wall right there. Uh, and so I can now perceive that. And it's not just from us as humans, right? Uh, we have these, but that's not our only sense, right? We've got these things, yeah, uh -huh. I, literally me touching, right? I can feel this. These are all my senses. And so what happens after I, you know, the environment giving off this and my sensors saying, hey, I can't, you know, I can't go through that. That's where we start to get into what we call the agent's function. I've taken in, or the agent has taken in all of these uh, inputs that they received. And then, again, you've, you learned this, right? This is the black box concept uh, that you learned in 116, right? Uh, input goes in, something happens, output comes out. In the agent's perspective, well, that output is typically a decision, right? That idea of... Oh, what should I do next? That's, a, that's the way I want you to start to think about this. What should I do? Not just what should I do next, right? So that is where we get into this concept known as the actuators, right? 
how do, what do I do uh, and how do I interact with the environment specifically, right? Suddenly, I'm an agent. Now, I have spawned into the world. I have my sensors all going on. I have actuators. Actuator one, actuator two, three, four, right? If I want to, say, move to the next slide, think about what actuators I have to move, right? You, you kind of remember this from 116 land where we were just trying to teach you about procedural language, but the same thing's happening here uh, in artificial intelligence. I got to figure out the decision of, oh, that's what I should lift now. Now which leg should I lift? Should I lift this one again? Actuator one? No, because that makes it get worse. And I'm not going to go lower. Y'all don't pay me enough. I showed you how much you pay me. Uh, no. So you don't pay me enough to do splits for you. Uh, so again, when we think about the actuator, what's going on is, all right, I'm going to remove the concept of a 3D world from us for a second, right? That makes, you certainly have to, you certainly have to deal with 3D geometry. And I don't, you know, okay, let's just understand the concept. So think of it like a two-dimensional plane, right? This is an agent that exists in a world that is only nine blocks big. And the agent only exists in the center at tile B2. All right, well, again, the agent can perceive around it. And this is where you determine, and we'll talk about this in a little bit, but you or the agent starts to see what it can see, what, what are, does it see with its sensors. And let's arbitrarily say, you know, a camera, right, that's very similar to what we have as eyes uh, going on. And the antenna could also be something uh, that it's receiving. These are just more examples of sensors. But that idea of the actuator. So... The analogy here, or the concept here, this leads into what you're doing in your lecture exercise and what you will be doing in problem set one, is what if you have an agent that is designed to clean messes off the floor, right? You've seen a Roomba. Who here owns or has owned a Roomba? Okay, right, I don't even own one. Y'all are rich. Uh, no, no, I wish I won't. Anyways, my point being is, okay, well, the agent saw the world around it, and so now, hey, it perceived that the tile right next to it was, uh, or is, in effect, dirty. So what should it do? Well, the actuator is the thing that uh, the agent uses to change the environment, right? And the environment should adjust as necessary, right? If the agent says, I want to move left, if that was just the action, ignoring, like, all the different joints, it's just move left, right? The environment changes because your or that agent's state is no longer in the same spot. They're in a new location even just in the world. And so that's where we start to kind of build things up, right? I mentioned this idea of the Roomba, right? The, this self-cleaning robot that goes to a nice little charging station. And if you've ever watched your Roomba, sometimes you know exactly what's about to happen. Right? It does it. But what other things, again, think about this from a program perspective, did I just learn about that entire thing? Well, again, I started from here at this location, and it took some number of steps in this direction, from this orientation. If this was my charging station, right, I now know the orientation of the charging station, I know the, the, the number of degrees that my wheels or legs had to change to shift location. So from my original orientation, I knew I turned 90 degrees, or that would be negative uh, 90. One, two, three, four. I now know four steps was enough that I am now at a collision. Okay, now the agent's starting to learn the world around it. What, is, what does it do? Why does it back up? Well, it's because it knows it can't go that way. From that negative 90, maybe I turn five degrees. One, two, three, four. Oh, from there, and you start to notice it's math. It's geometry all of a sudden where it's all about 
turning in lines, turning in lines. And that creates what we call the precept sequence. That's what the agent starts, you know, you don't have to implement these things, but that is, in essence, like, oh, I remember everything I've seen uh, before, right? That's the agent saying, let me store all of this information uh, as it bumps and stumbles around, and now it knows where those, you know, from where that orientation or that, uh, that uh, you know, origin point is, where all the collisions where are, where it will bounce off. And so what you can do with this, even just that simple little thing, right, not thinking mar uh, uh, machine learning at all, just the most basic concept that you walk away with here, I could just store that in a dictionary and do a key value lookup of like, well, what's the state of the world, right? What do I see? And if any of these, you know, permutations of the world uh, work or, or match something I have in my, my dictionary, oh, I have an associated action that I can go and do from there. And you'll see this. This is lecture exercise one in a nutshell of like, oh, if the uh, tile I'm on is clean, uh, but my neighbor's dirty, I know it. I have a, a very, I have an action that I can take to do that. And that's where, well, hey, you could also do this from multiple sequences of events, right? What was the action I took before? Have I taken this action? Okay, well, I might be able to store that. Hey, you know, A1 was dirty, and then A1 was clean. So I, I sort of know a history of the world at the same time. So I can, you're more than willing to, you know, store every one of your actions. Some of you, uh, this is more of like, I won't call it a hint, but this is something I've seen out of problem set ones. Some of you implement a stack for problem set one because, you know, you, that's a little nugget of like maybe stack, stack question mark, right? The idea is, oh, well, what happens if you run into a spot where you're no longer in a dirty area, right? You're, you're surrounded by clean tiles and you have to clean, you know, you have to clean the dirty tiles. Well, let's backtrack a little bit. Let me, let me step backwards uh, in time, and that's what the stack can give you uh, from there. And we'll talk about uninformed search next week. Um, but what that starts to give us now is, well, hey, again, the agent can perceive the world, get some inputs, make a decision right, you know, through some algorithm, and then output some action. So very similar. Again, it's, it's methods from every one of your classes. You understand them. But that's where we can kind of go, all right, well, now, how do I evaluate that, right? What kind of actions should the agent be focused on? And that's where we start to build out this idea of what we kind of gauge is, well, what's a good agent versus a bad agent? You sort of saw this. That was 316 land, right? What was big O? The concept was, oh, how efficient is an algorithm? Well, we're not really going to be talking efficiency here. Everything's, you know, MP hard, but not, not everything. But, you know, when I'm designing out these types of agents, well, what do I want to gauge as a metric that this agent is successful at its job compared to some other agent, right? Just like the algorithms that you saw in 316. Um, so if we're starting to think about it, like, Oh, you know, I keep talking about this idea of a, a self-cleaning robot, right? A robot sees that there's something dirty on the floor, uh, go clean it up. Well, you know, take that to its, you know, monkey paw natural conclusion. Well, if it cleaned up a pile of mess and its job is to clean up piles of messes, and if you use a performance metric like, uh, let me count how many tiles my, my agent cleaned. Okay, well, I, I have all of this mess as an agent, why don't I just dump it back on the ground and clean it back up, right? Would I be doing, as an agent, would I be doing a good job? You say no, but if my metric was number of tiles I cleaned, I'm doing a great job, right? So yeah, I know, right? We, we know that that's not right, but again, this is that concept of when we're designing out these algorithms and designing out these performance measures, we have to kind of ensure that what we're giving the agent is something that is what we explicitly wanted, right? This is the same idea that you, again, learned when you first learned the idea of programming, making sure you give it explicit instructions over 
I thought it would do something. No, remember, it has to be that explicit. Uh, so again, when we think about that, that's where we start to get into, okay, if I'm going to have to be explicit with it, right, that kind of can lead into you know, tricky things. Now let's start to think about agents that are not in your home cleaning your floors, but maybe agents that are around campus delivering food for you. Wouldn't it be great if you didn't have to go to the Oval? Yeah, thank you, thank you. Uh, right? I, maybe, may, wouldn't it be great if you didn't have to walk to those food trucks that are on the other side of May, Centennial Campus, right? What if uh, uh, they came to you? Oh, all right. But we've run into a problem, right? Now we have to assess the real world, the outdoors, where people exist and we're monsters, right? Think about an agent for a second that needs to cross the road, right? Okay, let's stop. You can treat your, this like yourself for a second. What do you do when you cross the road? I know exactly what you do because I have to slam on my brakes. <laughs> it's not bad. You only got to get hit by a truck once uh, in my life. That's, that's my, uh, my life lesson there. Uh, no. You know, well, what, what would you do? Okay, well, you go to the crosswalk, and you, or the agent goes to the crosswalk uh, and looks to the left, looks to the right, doesn't see anything. Ah, you move, right? That's what you do, you know, right? Okay, fine. Rational agent would maximize expected outputs. So it walks and crosses the road. Well, I have a, uh, I have a problem with this problem. I have a, 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 a crowbar curveball for you. I said, I looked to the left, looked to the right. Did anybody look up? Um, no. Oh, yeah. You, you didn't look up and expect that a whale was going to fall on you, uh, right? If you understand that reference, great. If you don't read Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, it's kind of like a mandated, you're a computer scientist read it. Uh, no, so again, that concept comes in. You're not going, you know, you don't do that. A rational agent, right? It's not going to be feasible for you to under, try and evaluate and uh, think of every possible situation. In certain situations, in certain, you know, games and things like that, you can have the agent uh, plan for everything. You could plan for this, but again, you, you learned 316. How much would the search be? What kind of big O would that turn out to be? Big O big, <laughs> right? Just, you can't, just, it's an infinite number of possibilities and you're trying to play multiverse all of a sudden. Uh, no. So that's where what we do, uh, or you know, what we kind of start out with as a sort of baseline to the entire concept of designing out an agent is what we call uh, the P's. So the performance measure, the environment, the actuators, the sensors. Just sitting down before we start, you know, throwing code to the wall or importing all of our libraries. Right. The first thing is, hey, all right, I'm going to be designing. Right. This is the same thing that we've hopefully taught you over the years about, like. You know, think before you do your, your things. And let's arbitrarily say we're looking at the self-driving vehicle problem, right? We are getting closer, but none of us have a self-driving car. And if you do, <laughs> right, the entire idea is, okay, well, what would be a performance measure for a self-driving car? Okay, well... We want it to be safe, right? We, we don't want it colliding into pedestrians. We want it to be uh, efficient, right? And fat, when I say fast, I don't mean it's, you know, going 90 on, uh, through a school zone. I mean that, it sh you know, when it's trying to go through and do the Google mapping path, you know, pathway, you know, when you're on Google Maps, you don't want something that's going to take you seven hours when, you know, it, it's a five-minute drive. So we want something that is correct, legal, again, that same kind of concept. 90 through 35 is not exactly that. Uh, comfortable trips, uh, you know, I've, I've driven with my mother uh, as an adult. and Because <laughs> I like to take sharp turns. Uh, but, all, you know, if you're, again, like someone like Uber or Lyft or uh, food delivery uh, self self or on campus self driving food delivery bots right you would want this to be efficient oh and when i mean efficient in that sense of maximizing profits 
right? That's, uh, what is it? That's the traveling salesman problem from 316 suddenly. Make sure that I can get to all the places in the minimal, a minimal amount of traversal to get, in this case, the maximum number. But what would the environment be for this type of thing? Okay, well, again, we have to sit down and think, okay, what is this agent going to be dealing with? And, well, the environment for something that is self-driving, yes, it's out in the real world. And for us as people who have driven a car or ridden in a car, a lot of these do seem like uh, things that we understand. So the roads, right? Every nuance of, like, whether it's a... a, a uh, a, a full line, a full line, what is the, a dotted line or just a straight line, uh, other traffic, other vehicles out there because they can suddenly, uh, sharp turns, pedestrians, again, are not looking at their phones as they step into the road, uh, or just general customers inside who want to, like, fiddle with the steering wheel of the self-driving vehicle, right? That's safe. Uh, but then we get into that idea of the actuator. So what would the actuators for a self-driving car be? Again, if you've messed with a car at any point in your life, some of these kind of make sense, right? Everything that you would need to, you personally as an agent, as an intelligent agent, would choose, right? The steering wheel, the accelerator, brake, blah, blah, blah. But then when we get into sensors, it gets a little harder because we only have five senses, maybe six. I'm not, you know, whatever. Right, the idea is, oh, it would be something like cameras, sonar potentially, right, where you know you're, you're using sound to try and map out the world, lidar, so you're shooting lasers out and measuring the distance, uh, the speedometer, the GPS, all of these different little sensors that could be are used to now uh, see what's going on in the world. But that, okay, that's a car. That's easy for us to process, you know, or that personally is easy for me to process as a as a human. But let's look at other agents that have existed out there in the world. So what about uh, the AI-generated antenna from NASA? Well, if you notice, that's not a car. That's, that's not, it wasn't even a robot, right? Because Rob that cost, all of those parts cost money. And when we're talking space travel, it costs a lot of money, right? So it's not even a, a robot. It's software, suddenly. So when we think about those actuators, right, how are those rotations occurring? Well, again, you could think about it. I'm using robotic arms here, but those could be simulated robotic arms. Those could be real-world robotic arms. Uh, you know, if you've watched any of the, uh, the new stuff out there as, uh, that gets posted onto the Internet, uh, that is like research uh, results, oftentimes they, they stress the importance of the simulation as part of the training process. Before we get into real-world, which costs money, right, Let's go into this, the simulation that doesn't cost money, you know. Um, and so you can see, hey, you know, uh, some of this I have no idea about because I, I don't understand. I don't know what beam width is. I assume it's something to do with beams and how wide they are. Thank you. Uh, right? Okay, fine. So, you know, and that does not look like something a human would design. But uh, to give you one final one to, like, stew on, right, what about... That thing, you may have seen it. it. You know, you've been on campus for a few days. Welcome back. Did you notice that Plant Sciences Building has a new kind of just 3D robot thing there? Have you read the story on it? Have you looked at it? Well, you know, I'm going to let you out eventually. Not early, but I'm going to let you out. Right? Go look at it. Right? Because it's it's AI. They're using AI, uh, and you get to see it in full display. It's called Benchbot. The entire idea is, as you can see, they've got plants just lined up in rows and with little QR codes here. And what's it designed to do? Track plant growth. That's it. As the plants grow, let's just watch them grow. Let's take a picture of their growth every hour, every day, whatever. And what they're going to do with that is they're going to then use AI to uh, now essentially build a repository of potential ways those plants look as they grow. So what would the agent be if it's trying to do plant tracking, right? That's not, it's not just uh, designed so that it's going to magically hit the same spot because what happens in the environment that could potentially cause uh, plants not to be in the same spot? Students win 
Students, wind, anything, right? We're in hurricane season, right? You know, what's going to happen to those if uh, we get a hurricane? So, oh, okay, well, hopefully they don't get knocked over. Otherwise, a grad student has to pick it back up. Uh, but the entire idea starts to come in is like, oh, well, that camera has to adjust so that it's right on top of it. Because if it's skewed, well, you, you've lost you know, data. It's terrible. And so that same kind of idea can come in. And these aren't the best, mostly because I didn't want to, I don't want to uh, say what it is since it's not work that I'm doing. Uh, but this is new stuff that they're kind of planning out with. Um, and so this is where, okay, I've shown you now three possible agents, self-driving car, uh, an antenna, now something just tracking plants. I'm going to, I want you to kind of memorize that picture, right, and store it in your brain. It's on the next slide, but now, if you have internet, cool. If you don't, for, let me just check if I can hook onto the internet. <sighs> Come on, EDU, Rome. It, okay, it roamed. Oh, sorry, I got to get back on Panopto. My chat is furious, I swear. Is anyone in chat? If you're watching at home, your, your, your name is chat. I don't, you know. Give me a second, I got to. Please do not chat GPT my, my lectures. Uh, okay. Uh, that should uh, load up soon. Okay, no, that's the wrong one. Give me a second. Carry the two. Question life. Okay, there's chat. All right, I'm back, I'm back, I'm back. Okay, so it sounds like the Internet's back up. Again, so the idea that I want to give you for a second and let your brains do. All right, you have sort of this design going on there. I don't want any of the things I've already given you, so like motors and camera. Don't give me those in your responses, because I already have those. I want to change this, because I, I like to grow hot peppers. I'm a, I'm a spicy person. I like uh, hot sauces. So I like to grow hot peppers, and maybe I want to start making uh, farming them. How would I convert that plant tracker into a gardening robot that can look at my pepper plants and make sure that they stay alive. Uh, so with that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you, let's see where we are on time. I'll give you till, uh, talk with your neighbors. We'll, I'll give you until 3.33. We'll come back in about uh, five minutes. Uh, there you go. <laughs> And if you have access, there's the in-class exercise to respond. And we are back. Let me see what you wrote. All righty. Oh yeah. No. It's okay. Luckily, uh, I don't. I don't. You know, keep track of who's what. You know, that's not really the point. This isn't for a grade. You know, some people immediately see me pull this up and are like, "Oh crap!" You know, he's track. No, it's not for a grade. It's you know, how are you doing? Uh, let's see what we got going on here. So uh, just cheat a little. Uh, okay, uh, number of peppers. So again, that kind of notion of uh, from a performance measure perspective, obviously uh, I'd like to have a high yield. So some of you are thinking about the gardening aspect from the harvesting style. And I don't mean it's wrong, but you're like, now think about that. When I, I, I gave you sort of this upper end of like, oh, you know, gardening. So immediately harvest or take care and raise to harvest, two, two technically different uh, uh, areas. Uh, so uh, if we're looking at that, um, I would say with some, I mean, this is where I'm, I'm nitpicking, uh, track pepper health. Uh, so I will say this is more for like feedback. So with this kind of feedback, 
you know, you're going to have one of these on your midterm, right? Um, this is wrong. This isn't a performance measure. This is a description of what your agent does, right? That's, it's different, right? It's, I am being pedantic. I am mincing words. But again, you're computer scientists, right? You know, I want a little bit more from you. I want that idea of like there is a, a number, right? That's what I want you to almost think about. There's a, there is a number that I can ascribe to how good this agent is compared to another agent, uh, right? That doesn't really, you know, that's not a performance measure. I can't ascribe a number to this. Um, ensure proper yield, right? That, you know, yield, I'm a, I'm a little more happier with something like that. Uh, maximum space it waters, you know, maximize uh, water coverage, uh, produce output, you're maximizing that. Watering schedule, I would say, you know, watering schedule is not enough, right? You know, be more efficient with your watering schedule. Otherwise, why am I, you know, paying thousands of dollars for AI when I can install a sprinkler system because I did that as a child, uh, right? You know, those are those types of things. Um, let's just keep on going. You know, most of it, you're, you're right. Um, what type of environment are we looking at? Uh, so if we're kind of eyeballing that rainfall, animals, temperature, um, the garden itself, greenhouse, uh, some of this, okay, I'll take greenhouse. That's more a little bit too much like, uh, you know, where it lives rather than how, what it's going to have to be interacting with, right? Pests uh, or water levels. Uh, if you're thinking about it like maximizing water coverage, right, that's what we're kind of getting, getting at uh, of, uh, uh, of something that it would be an environment uh, uh, metric that it needs to receive as feedback. Remember, again, we as humans almost describe it all to what, how we, ex we, we feel things in the real world. But remember, at the end of the day, it's a program. So almost always ask yourself, can it turn into a number, right? Or can it turn into, when we get into actuators, right, an, an action? Um, so sun levels, right? Uh, that's photons, photonic levels, and photon sensors. Um, I'll take bar, yeah, barcodes, that's, that's the same as QR codes. You're cheating, right? That's you. You didn't want to give me an answer. Uh, let's see. Where are we? How often it rains? Water levels? Yeah. So um, those types of things. When it comes to something like animal interference, that I'm fine with that because that can be d distilled down into a true false value. Is there an animal present or not? Um, so yes, it's mincing words. Yes. I'll, welcome to welcome to trying to have a subjective question in a STEM course where we've always taught you everything is a true false answer, right? Yeah, welcome to subjectivity. Uh, let's see, so actuators, what are we dealing with here? Sprinklers, yeah, so again, this is that idea of harvest versus caring or nurturing uh, the garden. Both work, but, you know, think, you know, that's where if you were to take that, right, you see what uh, uh, you could in theory, go build a miniature version of BenchBot at home and try and tackle this problem. That's a startup idea for you. You're welcome. I want 10%. Uh, equity, now, right, on the idea. Uh, so, again, you could do that. My question then would be presenting you, hey, would you be focusing on the care focus or the harvesting focus when you design out this gardening robot uh, that, you know, as you go into that world? because it's going to require you to spend money on different actuators. And sensors are going to cost different amounts of money than sprinklers. And if you try and do them both, that costs you more money right? in your prototype suddenly. So this is not me like mincing it. It's almost me telling you, hey, if these are what you want in your, your, your gardening robot, right? every one of those is going to be a, a, a price. Uh, but let's just see. Uh, I said not to say QR sensors, and someone said QR sensors. Measuring tape would be interesting because, again, it's a, it's a robot that would be doing the measuring tape. If you mean that it's always present, I'm okay with that. But if it's like it has to do the measuring tape, that's a bit off. Um, the, the rest of these, yeah, they're all mostly correct. You know, pH indicators, those are difficult. There, is no, uh, there isn't an automatic pH sensor for soil. Uh, I tried to build one of those when I tried to tackle this problem uh, 15 years ago. Yeah, unless they've made one, at which point I already got the database ready. I'm, I'm set. I can do this. Uh, I will all hire you for nothing. Uh, anyways, 
Okay, moving on, moving on. So, okay, now that we're talking about this idea of like trying to explore this from a programming perspective, not just like out there in the real world, um, but that kind of, you know, everything could be technically an environment, that's where we get into this notion of observability. What can the agent see? Right? This is why I start to separate things from that notion of like a human in the 3D world because we see a lot and then we don't see a lot. There's a lot of uh, unknowns in the environment. I don't know what's going on in Peru right now, right? Because I can't perceive it. So, you know, it's hard for me. There's things about the environment that I exist in that I, I can't perceive. However, what if I designed an environment where the agent could perceive everything? Something like a chess playing robot, now much smaller in scale and you know, a clearly solved problem. But what we kind of refer to this as is this is a notion or this is what we would call uh, a completely observed environment. You, as an agent, if you're thinking about all the possible moves, can see the direct output of every action that would occur in the game. You can map that out. Uh, and you'll actually see that while it is a big traversal, you know, later in the semester we'll talk about how we uh, are actually efficient in, you know, chess playing, and that's a solved problem in AI. Um, again, like I was thinking, uh, saying when we think about ourselves, but I'm going to separate from us to something more real world, uh, right? When we start to get into that notion of uh, like a self-driving car into the real world uh, space in that environment, well, it gets more difficult, right? Think about the self-driving car and what it can perceive and then what it cannot perceive the second it gets out of its view, right? Well, if it's a computer, right? I'm the, I'm the car. I have a camera on the top of my thing and it's going and then your, your other cars, and then this happens. I can't see you anymore. You don't exist. Right? We know that that's not correct. We understand object permanence, but how do you get a, an agent to do that? How do you get a program to do that? And so, you know, yeah, while LIDAR may be able to give us something like depth, what's behind the depth, right? If I can see this car, well, what's happening in between here? That's what we would consider a partially observed environment. I can see parts of an object, but they're occluded by something that's closer in frame. You no longer see a water bottle. It no longer exists. Why? Because it's partially observed. Do you know what orientation it's currently in? If you're cheating on these sides, don't, right? You, you don't know if I've rotated it, done a thing to it. I, I am moving it, or am I? I can't tell. Right? Does it look like I'm moving it? Yeah, they can tell you I'm moving it, right? You, didn't, you can't tell. That's what partially observed starts to get into, and some environments are like that. And then we start to get into that notion of like, oh, well, hey, you know, we also have uh, the concept of like a single agent versus a multi-agent uh, uh not environment, but solution, right? Swarm optimization. Who here has ever played with drones, right? Have you ever programmed, like, multiple drones in unison? That'd be really cool, though, right? We've all seen the light shows on the Internet, right? Uh, well, hey, you know, are they communicating with each other or are they uh, uh, competing against each other? So, you know, I, I, I'm trying my best to get an AI competition built here at NC State where you fight your friends because uh, I think that would be hilarious. Uh, but, right, again, oh, it's you as an agent or your, your agent and having to deal with another agent that's also doing its own thing. Or could they uh, cooperate or could they communicate? Do they talk to each other? You know, if they're competing, probably not. But if they're cooperating, communication probably is very important. And what would that communication look like uh, is also types of things. So, you know, if you're thinking about it, like, let's arbitrarily use the self-driving car. Uh, uh, um, it's so close to our reach, right? Let's imagine every car is self-driving on the road. Well, they're probably going to communicate with each other uh, because, you know, if they're all talking to each other uh, and they can see each other, or they're not talking. If they can all see each other and they're all built by the same manufacturer and we understand the concepts 
of you know, needing to know these types of uh, informations and how that can be safe, like how would they start to work? Um, you know, the, you've seen, uh, you may have seen videos of like self-driving car parking lots uh, out in California uh, and how they honk at each other at 4 a.m. Um, but again, they're communicating, right? Look, actuator, hey, we're too close. Hey, we're too close. It's just at 4 a.m. and we sleep. Uh, but then we got to keep on thinking about other ways that the environment can uh, operate and work. And that's where we get into this idea of something being deterministic versus stochastic. Well, deterministic is this idea that it's, again, I know what will happen at every situation. Right? Uh, any action I do in tic-tac-toe, I know exactly what will happen. And I don't mean like I know the uh, solution to the game. I know that if I uh, put an X on the top left, that's where the X goes, right? And my agent would know the exact same thing. It could forecast that uh, and predict that. But stochastic, uh, it's a you know, fancy word of saying random suddenly. You know, you're playing poker. You want to, you want to take your skills of, uh, hey, I really like gambling uh, and sports betting. I don't know why I picked that one, but uh, that's popular in North Carolina now. Uh, I want to take gambling, uh, and I want to build an agent, because that's just math, right? Uh, some of you, I saw a look of like, uh, it's not just math. Don't do that. That's how you, yeah. Uh, why? Well, it's because you can't predict everything. Oh, the math is right, and then your opponent has a full house, right? Okay, your math doesn't always work out. But that, how would an agent start to play that? And what we kind of do instead, if we can't map out everything, if we can't find the exact solution to a win, what we change our idea to is the agent is performing a strategy, also known as a policy. It doesn't know the end game, but it has kind of a, a vision of what to do, right? It, this is the decision it's going to work off of. Then we've got, uh, this one always seems to get, uh, I've noticed this one always trips students up, so I will sort of kind of, uh, if you get confused, ask me. Um, so one other way uh, we look at the environment is through this concept of it being discrete or continuous, episodic or sequential. Episodic. When I think about episodic uh, uh, environments, what I'm trying to kind of refer to there is, let's say I arbitrarily showed you uh, that image, right? Does that image move? No, right? It's, it's a picture of my face, or not even a picture of my face. It's, a, it's an outline of my face uh, and just mapping out different shapes. However, if I were to feed this image into an agent, a computer program, and it's designed to tell me what the shape is, right? That's what we would call a classification algorithm. Now, technically speaking, this could, in theory, be something that is in the real world. It doesn't technically have to only be for images. Uh, so this is where, like, um, assembly lines. A great example would be, I'm going to use my father uh, for this. So my father used to work at Kelly Springfield, now Goodyear Tire Plants. I don't, you know here in North Carolina. So, okay, well, you build a tire. Do you just immediately ship it out? No, it goes through testing, just like you have to test your code. They have to see if there are any imperfections in the rubber because nobody wants their tire to blow out when you're going 75 on 40, right? You shouldn't be going 75 on 40. Uh, but you do, uh, and you don't want a tire to malfunction because of you know, a fault. Fault detection uh, in factory assemblies is episodic. Uh, that's the best way I can think about it. It's really good in that cl classification world. But you know why it's episodic is because I look at one tire, I give it the green light, or I give it the red X, and then I move on to the next tire. And the, it's a completely new world. It's a completely new entity that I'm reviewing. Uh, I don't care about that other tire at all right now. That's someone data analytics to see if there's uh, a trend, right? The, the agent just decides good or bad tire, good or bad tire, good or bad tire. That's it. Sequential agents, on the other hand, or a sequential environment, what that starts to get at is this idea of like moves on the chessboard. Oh, if I move, do I go to a new chessboard? No, I stay in the same chessboard, 
but I have moved forward in time. We refer to that as a time step uh, suddenly. So, oh, at time step one, the board was, you know, neutral. It was at the start, right? At time uh, step two, uh, I don't know, I don't know chess well enough, king's pawn two spaces, right? Yeah, the scholar's opening. That's, that's, that's how good I am. Uh, no, anyways, uh, again, we'll talk about these in much more detail because a lot of your environments uh, for your problem sets are going to be working off of this, and these are much more complicated problems, right? When it's a, a classification, right, slap a, a neural network, you know, on it and you're done kind of thing. When you start adding that, you know, the environment continues after you, you do that, that's where it gets a little more complicated uh, in the simulations in the real world. And also, again, these time steps, again, they have different ways to be presenting themselves. It depends on how your, what your task is, right? If you're working in a self-cleaning robot to degrid, right, you're, you know, your time steps are an action, and then you can wait until your next action. If it's a chessboard, it's the move you make. A time step, though, if you're trying to play the other version of gambling where you try and build an automated uh, stock trading robot, uh, you know, think about what you would want as your time steps. Do you want it every second, every millisecond, every minute, every month, right? Who here, don't actually admit this, who here owns crypto? <sighs> get off your crypto, get off Get off your Coinbase and your Robin Hoods. Uh, no, I'm, you know, right? My, my point is, like, the, well, what do, we, what do a lot of people do when they're you know, trading you know, crypto, crypto or stocks? They're looking at charts, and they're watching the charts go up and down, and then the charts do that at different intervals. Um, you know, anyone want to have a fun guess at when this happened? This was a pretty relevant once upon a time. Huh? Say it loud. I heard it. Not 2008. A little sooner. Or COVID. This is when, you know, that moment in COVID four years ago where we all just went, oh, Tiger Keening, Dalgona Coffee is awesome. Uh, but, you know, how do you design out an agent that would predict that, right? Think about, like, how, you, you know, what, what trend would you be watching from your inputs? Or do you have to like fancily, oh, I got to start reading re newspapers and gaining sen uh, you know, uh, semantics uh, uh, of newspapers to kind of understand that, right? So, you know, again, uh, this is actually an interesting point. This is why now, you know, uh, when I wrote these slides and what we've seen from academic papers versus what uh, uh, financial companies may be doing, that part I don't understand, but Anyone who's tried to build uh, these, these automatic trading agents with artificial intelligence, oh, again, let's just use the neural network, right? They don't, they're not great, you know, 60% accurate, you know, that seems nice, but that's also predicting past data because we don't know what's going to happen. I know, right? We don't know what's going to happen in the future, <laughs> right? And so, you know, anything could be happening. COVID could ha come back again. Uh, and so, like, you, how do you predict these things? You don't. Um, but either way, moving forward, continue with the idea of, like, what an environment can do. Um, so when we get into these different little things is we've got something like uh, this idea of static or dynamic. So static or dynamic? Chess. Who here plays chess? Okay. Who here plays chess with a timer? Who here does not? They just play it for fun, right? Congratulations, you now understand the difference between static and dynamic. No timer, right? Let me just think about my moves. I'm not trying to win a championship. I don't care what my LO score is, right? I just want to play. Let me have my moment. Let, me, let the world, you know, your friend might, you know, start digging on you if you take 10 minutes to plan out a move, but, right, the environment doesn't change around you. However, when we start getting into dynamic, well, that, you know, something like a, a chess with a clock where, you know, the environment is now technically changing, 
I don't even know what happens when the clock goes to zero. I guess you just lose moves. You're not allowed any more. What happens when the clock goes to zero? You lose? Oh, my goodness. Right? So the environment's changing as you think or your agent thinks. Or think about that from the self-driving car, you know, real-world example. As the self-driving car decides whether or not to hit the gas or the brake, rest of the cars are going, right? People are moving. The world keeps turning. So that's where we kind of get into the uh, uh, difference. Um, mm -hmm. uh, we already sort of talked about the idea of uh, discrete versus contigu uh, continuous. Um, checkers is pretty discrete when we think about it, right? Uh, if I'm playing checkers or chess, right, there are only a set number of moves I can make, right, at any given moment. Chess uh, or tic-tac-toe or, um, you know, your problem sets are going to be discrete. Uh, if you have a two-dimensional plane, right, if we play that uh, analogy of the two-dimension plane, right, here's your three-by-three three grid. Here's your agent who surprisingly looks like a human, right? What are all the moves it can do? Well, one way to think about it, the discrete way, is there are four directions that it can move, up, down, left, and right. That's a discrete number. Continuous, on the other hand, if, and this is definitely uh, you know, geared towards the a game AI students, contiguous, or continuous, suddenly it's a circle. And it's degrees, it's geometry all of a sudden. Do I go this degree or do I go this degree? Right? Because that's, oh, I have to turn. Well, how many degrees? And how, you know, if I'm saying how many degrees, how many degrees are there? Well, there's 360 degrees, but am I allowed to add frac uh, decimal points? Turn half a degree? Yeah, yeah, all right, well, if I can do half a degree, I can do a, a fourth of a degree, an eighth of a degree, a sixteenth of a degree, a thirty-tooth of a degree. You know, I can keep going as much as I want. It all depends on just how fine my motor was, uh, right? So that's where we start to get into the differences there, and we'll see them crop back up a little bit later on. Um, but just to keep going through these, some of these uh, are a little bit, you know, you will need to know them, but not like... You will need to know them for the exam, uh, and it's good to understand the differences because, right, it depends on your environment. When you're designing out sort of your worlds for your agent, you should probably think about what the environment's going to, you know, what kind of environment, not just what's in it, but, like, what kind of environment you'd play off of. Uh, but in this case, the known and the unknown. Uh, so, you know, again, does the agent know everything that could possibly happen in the world, right? Chess, it knows every possible move. Uh, unknown, it doesn't know. Uh, and, and more to my point, um, you know, uh, uh, something like uh, poker and whatnot. That's you could, you know, you could kind of map everything. So what I'll, I'll kind of use as a better example is this, the self-driving robot. Does it know what the traffic is like? You know, five minutes away. No. You know, it might be able to if it can get communication, but it doesn't, all, it doesn't know what the weather is going to be like, right? It doesn't have all the information, uh, and so that's where uh, the agent might ha have some unknowns going on. Uh, what if it's something it's never seen before? You're going to start dealing with that with problem set one, uh, the Roomba suddenly, right? The Roomba started right here. You plugged it in. It got charged. It's never been in your house before. What's it do first? Runs into a wall. Why? Because it doesn't know any better, right? It doesn't know any better. Uh, so that's where uh, there is a difference between these two. Um, so uh, this one, there isn't an activity on Moodle. This is much more, I'm going to open this as more of a discussion since I got 15 minutes. We got enough time, I believe. Uh, so let's take that self-gardening agent, right? What kind of environment would that gardening agent be in? All right, would it be completely or partially observed? Not all at once. Is it specifically outside, or can it be in a greenhouse or something? 
I mean, it could be in a greenhouse, yeah. Okay. All right. I'll take. I'll. You know what? I'll actually take that. It's a yeah. I'll, fair assessment. So a difference there, depending on you know, real world conditions. Uh, you could force it to be a completely observed. Now it does. To, if you're looking from it on the top down perspective, but we're looking for the. I'd be okay with it. You made a good point. You made a good argument for it. So, um, so yeah, you could do kind of both of them. Again, this is much more subjective, uh, but I will kind of present the next one then. Uh, for our self-gardening agent, single agent or multiple agents? This would be single agent unless we have a, a system where there are multiple for some reason. Yeah, I mean, again, you know, do I have a single agent, the big bench bot, or do I have uh, a thousand uh, tiny drones with little scissors that they, you know, just fly around with? Oh, yeah. You like that book. That just That's a nightmare for all of us. Someone different. Someone maybe not in the front row. Deterministic or stochastic? I would say stochastic. Because there's still the stochastic is the law of probabilities going on our ground. Yeah. Uh, I mean, yeah. So, like, we know the plant's going to grow in, like, come to fruition, uh, but it's still kind of in, uh, stochastic in that space of like, well, you know, it doesn't have to fruit, right? Uh, the conditions, even though we're trying to, you know, uh, optimize for them, bad genes, right? You know, that's, we don't just, it's not just like one pepper. It's, you know, it, it has a DNA sequence. Um, episodic or sequential? Sequ why? Okay, I'll take it. You know, uh, you see, um, if we're trying to optimize for crop yield, maybe you're pruning at some points, right? And so that means you're you're cutting things off so that it's not drawing uh, additional water for nothing. So yeah, and then that becomes like the new state of that plant. You could argue episodic, I think, um, because uh, you're working on a plant by plant basis. So it's now like high level kind of thing. So I, I, I would actually, again, uh, this subjective, I would take both. Uh, static or dynamic? Why? If you don't decide fast enough, plants might die. Um, you know, if you're taking 100 years, because, you know, time is a construct and the robot doesn't have to solve it in 10 seconds, right? It could solve it in 10 thousand years um, that so yeah the plant could die uh, and that's again we're now looking at sort of kind of the scope of our things right if we look at it from that perspective of time then absolutely right these are real life things going on there um, I will not I'm, I'm gonna try I'm trying to like shoehorn a way to think of it like static if we assume time uh, you know, in a much finer, you only, you know, 10 second window or plant by plant, it may be against, you know, subjective. This is not things you explicitly code out. This is more like how you think about the world and your agent's interaction with it. Um, discrete versus continuous, I'll just go ahead and say it would be discrete. Uh, sorry, it would be continuous uh, because, uh, you know, if we're looking at pepper harvesting, the peppers are not all in the same spot uh, on each plant, right? They're going to be in different locations. So you have to have something that can finesse. You can't just move down 10 inches, right? Um, but to just keep on going, you know, as we kind of get into these ideas of like agents and how we start to design them out, right, this is where we start to get into, well, hey, you know, we could just take our, our current precepts and react as is. We call that a simple reflex agent. Or we could take the entire history, but this becomes a major issue. And this is the issue that we've been having for about 20 years about the concept of big data, right? Now we're getting into storage. It's still cheap, but like to store everything that we are producing uh, from a data perspective, just even like I wanted to do some kind of uh, home defense agent. And I don't mean like it's going to shoot people. I just mean like, hey, can you detect if someone's breaking into my house? 
Okay, well, how would you monitor that? Well, you have to have something running 24-7 to train. Uh, and if you've got a ring doorbell, well, okay, that's a 30 frame per second, uh, 640 by 480, 24-bit uh, color. That's math. You do the math. How much is that per second that you have to store? I don't know. Uh, I knew, you know, bust out your calculator and tell me. Because if you do that for 24-7 and then for 365 days out of the year, that's a lot of data. Um, so, and you got to store that somewhere, right? Because it's your training data. It's what you've seen in the past, effectively. Um, but uh, just for the sake of time, I, I kind of mentioned it, right? You could just have the agent react to the, the current stimuli, and that's it, right? Uh, we, I don't know if we still are. This is much more the engineering side. But, like, we put microchips on roaches, right? You know, yeah, terrifying, but also, like, science is sci-fi cool? You know, so like you, you pick whether or not it's cool or terrible. But like if you think about a roach, right, it, you know, do we consider that to be a simple reflex agent or not is how I'll kind of present that, right? It senses what's uh, going on, and it just has a bunch of, uh, uh, it has a, a dictionary lookup, uh, and that's it, right? That's, that's a simple reflex agent. That's what your lecture exercise one is. All you're dealing with is a simple reflex agent. Oh, the tile next to me is dirty. I go to it. It's not dirty. That one's dirty. There's none dirty. All right, I'm done. Right? Nothing around it's dirty, so it doesn't do anything. That's sort of what we get at when we think about uh, the, the um, simple reflex agent. A lot of you, when you build your problem set one, will start this way. It's not a bad way but you're going to hit some hiccups on some of the maps just to give you the warning uh, because you saw what you did in lecture exercise one, and you're going to build that into code, right? That's the easy answer. It's also not the most, it's not how you get a hundred answer, um, right? That's exactly what uh, is going on with lecture exercise one. But then we can make it a little bit more complex, and I, got, I see where I am on time, so I will get you out of here on time. Um, when we start getting out of it, uh, we can think about this as like, hey, model-based agents. Now, thinking about what's going to happen rather than just reacting to what is happening, right? Oh, what is the current state of the world? What are my possible actions that I could do in response to this? And then, yeah, you notice it's still a condition. It's still just a dictionary lookup based on that, but it's the thinking process, right? It's not just seeing and reacting. It's almost starting. It's not there yet, but it's starting to think about what would happen if the world, uh, what would happen to the world if I did the action. That's where we start to, okay, model not too much. But if we assign now a goal to our model, our, our agent's internal model of the world, uh, now we start to get something like, hey, it's not just what the world is like and what would happen to the world as I change. What will it be like? So now, oh, what would the world be like if I push over my thermos? Right? Did I push over my thermos? No. No. But I thought about it, right? And I envisioned it in my brain and what the world would look like in my brain. Uh, and so that's that same, same kind of thing. And then now that I've seen what I think the world would react to, this is that completely observed versus partially observed, right? I think the world or the environment would be like this afterwards. Okay, then I keep moving which turns into this idea of utility-based, because now if I have a goal, right, we're going to see uh, later on uh, that, you know, I, if I take 10 minutes or 10,000 years to, you know, decide whether or not to, you know, prune or, or harvest a pepper, right, both of those meet the goal, right? I harvested it, but the pepper's dead already, right? The plant died uh, 1,000 years ago. So that's where we get into this idea of a utility or a happiness score. Uh, but to keep jumping through these, everything I've shown you, right, I still haven't talked about the concept of learning. That's just reacting, right? And we'll see all of these. This is all stuff we're going to be talking about. But it didn't learn from experience. It's just building uh, with what you expect the world will be like. Learning 
you know, based on your actions, when we think machine learning, re reinforcement learning, right? We haven't hit there yet. We are, we're, we're, we, this design that I've given you isn't. Because that's where you have to add in a critic to it. And if you've sat around and wa uh, uh, watched enough videos on like all the different ChatGPT models and how they've worked, right? They have a critic, right? The the reason why it, it can produce great sentences, I won't say real or fake. I'll just say like it can produce uh, coherent sentences, is because it had a, a coherency critic inside of it, where it looked at what it thought it should say and said whether or not that was good or bad. Right? Uh, and so that critic then gives and turns into feedback for the agent. That becomes the learning element. Hey, how good or how bad was my proposed move or my, the action I just did? Was it great? Cool, I learned. No? OK. And that changes. Oh, no, I did a bad move or I did a good move comes into play. And so that uh, adjusts as necessary. Uh, and that's what produces what we would consider knowledge in that area. Uh, and then you can go into really fancy stuff. Uh, and this is, this isn't like, this is the open part of like where simulations sort of live, right? Problem generation, right? Oh, you know, I have this agent. I have a critic to tell me how well I did in what environment. Well, again, the real world is maybe potentially too expensive for my agent to be operating in. So I might be generating new problems for it, new environments for it. Again, some of you are going into three uh, or uh, um, game AI development, and you will never build a game. Not in the, like, you, you, you don't succeed in your world. You become much more fascinated in the concept of the simulation. And so you start building much more on just, like, simulating things in your 3D spaces. Uh, so that's where you could think about the idea of experimenting, changing things. And we'll get into something like genetic algorithms later on. Um, but I don't really see you know, any tiles. So what would the agent do? Well, I propose some idea of maybe you let it explore. right? That's your strategy. If nothing is dirty around you, did you see dirty tiles previously? Maybe remember that you saw that tile D3 was dirty earlier. And I, I should remember that, but I only got a few uh, minutes left. And to, I, I don't always go into the game AI space, but you know, this one's really great uh, you know, as an example. Um, what if I was you know, building a security guard for uh, Metal Gear Solid or some video game, right? I have them patrolling. And you might notice this looks eerily similar from something from 216. What was it? Say it loud, say it proud. That's a finite state machine. You know how to build those. Congratulations. You now understand how to build AI in video games. You don't know pathfinding, but you have a way to build out those smarter, you know, those higher level concepts. The agent could uh, just be patrolling a given uh, location until it senses the uh, main character and then alerts the compound, at which point it decides what to do based on that. Do is it pursue or, uh, or defend uh, and whatnot? Well, what happens when the agent you know, goes into stealth mode? Nobody can find it. This isn't real life with police officers continuing the search. You know, they got an arrow in their head, and they're just like, all right, back to work. At which point, back to work to y'all. I'll see y'all next week. Have a good one.